Hi there. This lecture was originally delivered on October 12th, 2017 at the University of Texas of the Permian Basin. It was sponsored by the Department of Literature and Languages, who, which held its uh, inaugural Lunch and Learn event. And I'm Clark Moreland. I'm the lecturer uh, from that day and lecturer here at the university. This lecture is titled The Sword of Damocles, C.S. Lewis, Cambridge, and the Cold War. It's coming out of my recent research on C.S. Lewis, the novelist, poet, philosopher, Christian apologist, broadcaster, tutor at Oxford University, and professor of medieval and Renaissance literature at Cambridge University. I'd like to welcome you all. Unfortunately, we originally live stream or plan to live stream this event on our Facebook Live page, but because of internet connectivity issues, it was interrupted and we weren't able to stream it live. And so we've decided instead to re-record the lecture so you can watch it later on. So hope you enjoy. The photograph you are looking at was taken at the bridge crossing over the River Cam at around 8.30 in the morning before the punters start pushing tourists down the river. It was taken last July when I was attending the C.S. Lewis Foundation's Triennial Oxbridge 2017 Conference, a two-week gathering of over 200 scholars, artists, musicians, educators, and ministers celebrating the life and legacy of C.S. Lewis. Meandering down from Robinson College, where my lodgings were, through Burl's Walk, I crossed over the Garrett Hostel Bridge and entered the ancient city of Cambridge, where I spotted the Reverend Dr. Malcolm Geit, the legendary poet, priest, raconteur, and academic who serves as chaplain of Girton College, Cambridge. Smoke rising from his pipe, the walking cane in his hand, providing meaningless service as he briskly strode down the narrow cobbled lane of Senate House Passage in resplendent sunshine. I felt transported, as if I were walking behind the apparition of C.S. Lewis himself, sixty years after he trod these streets. As we turned toward our common destination of Great St. Mary's Church, I lost Malcolm in the crowds of morning commuters, sightseers, and university fellows making their way around Market Hill. Despite the modern shops like the McDonald's down the street from the church, Cambridge's town center harkens back to a pre-modern era, not only because of the centuries-old colleges, bookstores, and chapels that surround you, but also because few automobiles are allowed to drive into this part of town during the day. And one can understand why, then, C.S. Lewis, who had an aversion for modern machinery, ended up preferring the streets of Cambridge to the already congested lanes of Oxford the other city, as they call it, where Lewis attended and taught for 37 years before trading Magdalen College, Oxford, for Magdalen College, Cambridge. We had the privilege of spending nearly a week at each university, and at Magdalen I noticed a large memorial to soldiers who had lost their lives in the Second World War. Had Lewis only been born a few years later, he might have been one of the unfortunate ones on this list as he was just old enough to avoid conscription in 1939. Of course, Lewis had already served his nation honorably in the First Great War as a Northern Irish volunteer for the British Army, and he was wounded at the Battle of Arras in April 1918. As recent scholarship has shown, Lewis's efforts to support soldiers and the government went far beyond his responsibilities in the Home Guard, which involved him carrying around a rifle <laughs> around Oxford streets between 1.30 to 4.30 every Saturday morning, keeping eyes out for spies and, I suppose, a few stray Messerschmitts. Lewis's wartime broadcast talks on the BBC are the stuff of legend, and were originally, or eventually rather, worked into the most famous of Lewis's books on Christian apologetics, Mere Christianity. Lewis also gave lectures for the RAF, and, as Harry Lee Poe revealed last year, Lewis was even working as a government agent for MI6, recording a secret radio message for Iceland in an attempt to keep listeners there loyal to British interests. And I love this fact about him, that he was, you know, like Lewis. Jack Lewis. But <clears throat> what struck me most about this memorial was the name seemingly tacked on to the end later. And in Vietnam, 
J.A. Hotel, Silver Star, 1st Cavalry Division, U.S. Army. I was immediately reminded not only of the fact that Britain, while involved in many international conflicts after World War II, did not experience a culture-rocking, history-changing war like the United States had with Vietnam, but also I was reminded that C.S. Lewis died on November 22, 1963, 20 days after the assassination of South Vietnamese President Diem, and of course, the same day as the assassination of another key political figure in the Vietnam War, President John F. Kennedy. Even though conflict in Vietnam had been raging since 1945, Lewis never once mentions it in his vast correspondence. Yeah, one who is familiar with Lewis might say, that's not a surprising thing. After all, wasn't Lewis a scholar of medieval literature? Wouldn't he have been re rather reading Chaucer, Milton, or Spencer than reading the newspaper? Didn't Lewis say in his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, that he did not regret the appalling waste of time and spirit which would have been involved in reading the war news? Well, yes, <clears throat> Lewis had a notable disdain for journalism, even in peacetime. And yes, Lewis would much rather have stuck his nose in a book about knightly chivalry than one about modern cavalry. Yet, as John Wilson has said, Lewis has the reputation of never reading the newspapers, but he certainly knew what was going on in the world. Indeed, the more one examines Lewis's correspondence, especially during his time at Cambridge University from 1954 to 1963, as well as the works he produced after World War II, one comes to realize that Lewis was not so far removed from Cold War anxieties and issues as scholars have sometimes portrayed. But beyond demonstrating that Lewis was more of a news hound than has previously been assumed, I'm going to argue in this presentation and in the book that is coming out of my research on C.S. Lewis and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that Lewis's views on the ethics of violence and war are complicated by events after World War II, and three I'd like to highlight in particular. First is his acceptance of a professor's chair at Cambridge University in 1954. Second, the advent of the atomic age. And then finally, the cancer that eventually took the life of his wife, Joy, in 1960. First, let us briefly then examine Lewis's views on war before this period. <clears throat> when Lewis scholars typically look at the subject, they, they focus on texts that Lewis wrote during World War II, and that's with good reason. In the years leading up to the war, as well as during the Blitz, when bombs were falling on England, and the nation was mobilized like never before in its fight against Nazi Germany, Lewis was often called upon to offer a Christian perspective on international conflict and war ethics. In 1940, Lewis was asked by a pacifist society to speak on his views, and his uh, responding speech, why I'm not a pacifist, provides the basis of much of my summary, though I'll also be drawing from some other speeches, public and private letters, and three of his justly most famous books from this period, The Problem of Pain, 1939, The Screwtape Letters from 1942, and Mere Christianity, which was published in 1952, but is based on some broadcast talks that he did for the BBC from 1941 to 1944. Lewis rejected Christian pacifism, a theological doctrine that traces its roots to the dominical injunction in the Sermon on the Mount to love your enemies and turn the other cheek to one who strikes it, as well as other examples in biblical and church history, including Jesus' non-resistance to the crucifixion. Certain denominations of the Christian faith, for example, Quakers, Mennonites, Seventh-day Adventists, have made the rejection of violence, including service in war, a central part of their confession and theology. And pacifism in England, Christian or otherwise, has fluctuated in terms of popularity, but it really reached its apex after the First World War. Yet in his critiques, certainly uh, Lewis, living during the time of the two most famous proponents of pacifism in the 20th century, Mohandas Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., but he never mentions them. However, he did own books by other pacifists, and he knew many of its leading proponents in England going all the way back to 1914. So in the broader paper, which I'll attach to this lecture, I uh, am going to give more detail to Lewis's 
uh, basic arguments for the just war doctrine, which has been made for centuries. Just war doctrine rejects the argument that it is wrong or in a religious con context sinful to commit acts of violence in war on the grounds that first, pacifism, he says, is speculative. We don't know what would happen if people had taken a pacifist approach rather than fighting in a war. He says the law of beneficence or love sometimes requires nations to take defensive measures to protect people. As he memorably puts it, if you cannot restrain a man by any method except by trying to kill him, well then a Christian must do that. He says, by contrast, pacifism has problems too. It uh, implies a, a materialist ethic that says death and pain are the greatest evils. Whereas just war doctrine is supported by wise human authority, and he gives several examples here from his country and from the world, as well as from scripture, including apostolic writings, church tradition, and church fathers. Even after looking at the dominical sayings of Jesus, which Lewis claims is the highest authority for a Christian, he nevertheless argues that the Sermon on the Mount is often misread. People think it's talking about war violence when actually, he says, it is about the mortification of anger in situations of individual conflict. Lewis asks whether anyone supposes that Jesus meant that if a homicidal maniac attempting to murder a third party tried to knock me out of the way, I have to stand aside? and let him get his victim? He also mentions here that Jesus never condemned the Roman centurion, a soldier. And then he finishes up why I'm not a pacifist with uh, gently asking his pacifist audience whether they have adopted their stance to have really merely avoid the adversities of being a soldier. He says pacifism threatens you with almost nothing, while military service threatens every temporal evil. <clears throat> I have a feeling that Dr. Martin Luther King would have something to say about that, but we go on. It certainly is a formidable argument, which is to be expected from a dialectical champion like Lewis. However, every time, or almost every time, that Lewis discusses the weaknesses in the Christian pacifist doctrine, he always speaks humbly, almost shyly, about his views, and he claims that moral decisions do not admit of mathematical certainty. Likewise, in a 1952 letter, Lewis says, We must, of course, respect and tolerate pacifists, even though I think their view erroneous. Even at the height of World War II, you won't find Jack Lewis waving the Union Jack and advocating for a stronger military. In the Screwtape Letters, from 1942, the eponymous narrator tells his demonic nephew Wormwood that war has certain tendencies inherent in it which are in themselves by no means in our favor, our meaning his fellow demons. We may hope for a good deal of cruelty and unchastity. Well, surely he was not speaking only about the atrocities committed on the German side. And he advises his demonic pupil Wormwood that patriotism may be as useful as pacifism in getting his patient to focus on worldly ends. However, Screwtape does reveal another subtler reason why war is, if not justified, then sometimes unintentionally beneficial. He says that in wartime, people will realize the fragility of their existence. Perhaps they'll be driven by the fear of death to consider eternal questions, not to mention giving people examples of heroic sacrifice and solidarity, which were virtues that Lewis hoped would lead people to God and thus would be dangerous to the demons. Now, it would be disingenuous for me to say that Lewis rejected all of these views after World War II. In Mere Christianity, which was published after the war, Lewis says that he's always thought a Christian soldier had a right to kill an enemy, and I still think so, now that we are at peace. But then he adds a new wrinkle to his previous defenses of the Just War Doctrine. He says, in those days, there was the idea that people who fight must do so with a long face, as if you were ashamed of it. Yet he maintains that we must not hate and enjoy hating, but we may punish if necessary. We just shouldn't enjoy it. In short, Lewis is claiming that you can love an enemy while you are killing him. 
And, it, and you can enjoy fighting in a war, but not enjoy killing the enemy. As he memorably described the moral of his friend J.R.R. Tolkien's book, or uh, trilogy, The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien, he says, gives us hammer strokes, but with compassion. Hammer strokes, but with compassion. Friends, at the risk of having lightning striking me, I think this is the weakest uh, argument that Lewis makes for the just war doctrine. I just find it extraordinarily difficult to distinguish between the gaiety and wholeheartedness that he claims a good soldier should embrace and yet also be killing an enemy who, as Lewis admits, is according to Christian theology someone who lives forever. Besides, there's one other problem I see, and we'll talk more about this in a moment. Modern soldiers don't use a lot of hammers anymore. Well, I think Lewis realized this weakness, and it seems to me that the further we look into Lewis's writings about war in the 1950s, we start to observe some more misgivings in his previous arguments. When looking at Lewis in the Cold War period, one must begin and end with his masterpiece, The Chronicles of Narnia. The first two books written in this series, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and Prince Caspian, each contain memorable scenes of battle and violence. Think, for instance, of Peter wiping the blood off of the uh, sword from the wolf that he has just slayed. Or Aslan saving the day in the battle with the White Witch. Or you think about Caspian awakening to the need for war with his uncle Moraz. The most prominent commentary about pacifism in Narnia comes in the character of Eustace who, though not a Christian pacifist, still embodies all of the worst qualities of an intellectual snob which Lewis associated with pacifism. And, of course, he earns the valiant Mouse Reepicheep's disdain as a result. Yet, the latter books in the Chronicles of Narnia have a noticeably different portrayal of war and violence, as we'll see. Well, let's start with what I think changed in this period. What happened in between World War II and his time in Cambridge? Well, first, let's look at his decision to accept a professorship at Cambridge University. In 1954, Lewis writes to Mary Willis Shelburne. He says, Did I tell you I've been made a professor at Cambridge? I shall like Magdalen College better than Magdalen and Oxford. They're so old-fashioned and pious and gentle and conservative here, unlike this leftist, atheist, cynical, hard-boiled, huge moglin where he was. Perhaps, he says, from being the fogey and old woman here at Oxford, I shall become the infant terrible there in Cambridge. Now, I haven't uncovered any evidence that there were an influential figures at Cambridge who perhaps started to chip away at some of Lewis's anti-pacifist views, but it does seem as if Lewis felt surrounded by leftist radicals at Oxford, and when he comes to Cambridge, he feels freer to perhaps argue against both sides of the political spectrum. Yet that's not to say that Lewis was completely shielded from leftist criticism. One such criticism concerns the death of the children in the last battle. Philip Pullman has complained that Lewis's choice to kill the children off in a railway accident is not only disingenuous art, but is also a, quote, libel on life, and is propaganda in the service of a life-hating ideology. Whatever. Uh, I mean, the children not only defy death numerous times throughout the Narnia Chronicles, but also, initially, they were defying death by escaping the Blitzkrieg and coming to Professor Kirk's house. So how else did Pullman expect it to end? There is death all over Narnia, not just at the end. But as I was riding a train from Oxford to London one evening during the conference, a question occurred to me. Why have the children die? in a railway accident. Why have them die on a train? Well, beyond the convenience of perhaps killing off several characters at once with a train accident, I surmise that Lewis was thinking more about trains in general, because he was riding one every week, commuting from his home at the Kilns in Oxford to Cambridge starting in 1954, which was two years before The Last Battle was published. So we traveled to Cambridge at our conference by bus rather than train, and even then, it was a two-hour ride, 
So I can imagine how long it took Lewis to actually make this trek every week. And yet, in a letter in 1955, he writes that he finds himself perfectly content in a slow train that crawls through green fields, stopping at every station, where he can get a lot of reading done and sometimes say my prayers. I think he loved the time that he had to read and think on the train. Now, I suspect that most of Lewis's fellow train riders probably didn't look at their commute with such anticipation. If anything, they were probably passing the time by reading the newspaper. Is it not a stretch to also imagine that Lewis occasionally picked up a newspaper on the train as well? Oh, but the Lewis scholar will retort, Lewis didn't read the newspapers. And indeed, in a letter written in October 1955, Lewis does claim to never read the papers. He says, why does anyone? They're nearly all lies. Yet, in the problem of pain, Lewis admits that there are moments when one is progressing along the path of life and suddenly a stab of abdominal pain that threatens serious disease, or a headline in the newspapers that threatens us all with destruction, sends this whole pack of cards tumbling down. You see, like us, C.S. Lewis lived in a media age where news, even when you tried to escape it, found a way to invade your life anyway. But as you examine Lewis's correspondence in the 1950s, you see evidence that he was more attuned to the news, specifically international affairs, than even Lewis scholars have previously observed. And in the years before and during Lewis's time at Cambridge, the news was about the emerging Cold War between America and the Soviet Union. Nervous correspondents, particularly from America, would often write to Lewis and ask, what does this mean? In 1948, he begins corresponding with an American named Edward Allen, who would often send him care packages while the British were suffering under post-war rationing. And so in their correspondence, particularly beginning in 1950, he expresses concern to Allen, Lewis does, about the news from the Far East, which does not bear thinking about. He's referring, of course, to the war in Korea. He doubts the virtuous purpose of the American war in Korea, writing that his brother Warney, who was a retired officer in the British Army, guesses that the Korean War is a large-scale diversion to draw all available American and British forces to that theater as a preliminary for a southward drive through Persia to the Middle East oil fields in 1951, which in turn is probably a preliminary to a Russian quote, liberation of Western Europe in 1952. Goodness, certainly this does not sound like a man who doesn't read or think about the news. This seeming contradiction between Lewis's claims to avoid news and his letters being full of them has led Walter Hooper, the literary advisor to the Lewis estate and the editor of the collected letters of C.S. Lewis, among many others, to surmise that sometimes Warney Lewis made alterations to, and in some cases actually wrote and signed, some of C.S. Lewis's letters, particularly those that mention military strategy and political affairs. However, with much trepidation at the thought of contradicting Mr. Hooper, a scholar whom I met at the conference and whom I revere, one of the few men who actually knew both Lewis brothers, I think there are reasons to believe, or I should say that knew them while they were alive, while he's one of the few living ones left. I think, though, there are reasons to believe that these letters that Hooper is talking about, that I'm talking about, should be attributed to C.S. Lewis, or at least that there is not enough evidence in my mind to doubt that there is a significant difference in the way that Jack felt compared to his brother Warney. My paper, which will be posted along with this lecture, will explain my reasons why, but let us move on. Nevertheless, from the letters of this period, it seems that Lewis had a skeptical view of Western involvement in Korea. He asks in one letter, how is it going to end? We can but hope and pray for some speedy success. But then in the later letter, he says, what a mess the world is in, isn't it? Amen to that. Lewis speculates that Korea will be a prelude to a broader attack on France and Indochina, which of course he was right about, Indochina, Vietnam. And then his letters to uh, Allen in 1952 are even more prescient. He complains at one point, is this ghastly Korean war never going to end? 
Or are we going to spend the rest of our lives running round the Iron Curtain, stopping leaks in it? In April, he writes, I'm not quite sure whether we are playing into Uncle Joe's hand, that's referring to Joseph Stalin, by messing about in Korea and elsewhere. He says, maybe if we rearmed and resisted minor points, we might just prevent it from coming to a real showdown, but heaven knows, I'm as ill-qualified as anyone in the world to have an opinion. While Lewis expresses certainly reservations about the Korean War, he's disturbed because he says appeasement doesn't work, hasn't worked in the past, and limiting the fighting to the Korean Peninsula may actually be a better strategy than full-scale war with Russia. Yet he also has ambivalence towards American military power, just as much as the Soviet counterparts. In his 1945 novel, That Hideous Strength, Lewis writes that the organization that is leading a dastardly revolution to destroy faith in goodness in Britain, N-I-C-E, NICE, has also infiltrated the scientific and political institutions in America, and thus the vague idea of escaping to America, which in a simpler age comforted so many a fugitive, is denied to the protagonist Mark. Lewis was especially doubtful that virtuous political leaders in America would save the day, he writes, for instance, in 1954. As for Joe McCarthy, I never met anyone, American or English, who did not speak of him with horror. A very intelligent American pupil of mine said, he is our potential Hitler. Three years later, in another letter where Lewis complains about the behavior of American soldiers in the Far East, Lewis also addresses Sputnik and the space race, which play out in fascinating ways throughout his works. One might think that the author of a space trilogy published in the late 1930s and early 40s might embrace space exploration, but quite on the contrary. In his dark satirical poem, Prelude to Space, an epithalamium, Lewis portrays space explorers as rapists of the black womb of the unconsenting skies, while others watching the large steel member grow erect, before it imprints our likeness on the abyss, bombs, gallows, Belsen camp, that was a Nazi death camp, pox, polio, Tice kiss, or Judas, Moloch's fires, and Torquemada's sons resemble sires. In a letter written at the end of 1957, sounding very much like Dr. King, Lewis laments the extraordinary amount of government spending on, quote, the folly of this competition in satellites. He writes, I have yet to meet anyone who wants World War III civilian or soldier. Indeed, my brother often remarks that the only pacifists he has ever met are professional soldiers. They know too much about the game to be fire eaters. But lest we forget, and perhaps this was occasionally lost on Lewis as well, the space race was not merely a competition to see who could get to the moon or Mars first. It was also driven by the desire on both sides to gain an advantage in surveillance and tactical deployment of weapons, including nuclear weapons. In the late 1950s, it sounds as if Lewis was anxious about how the space race would lead to further escalation of tensions and development of nuclear armaments. Yet in an essay written the final year of his life, and only a few months after the Cuban Missile Crisis, Lewis takes a more fatalistic view of the space race. He writes, Nor am I much concerned about the space race between America and Russia. The more time, money, skill, and zeal they both spend on that rivalry, the less, we may hope, they will spend on armaments. Indeed, one detects fatalism in several of Lewis's writings on the advent of the nuclear age. The most famous example of Lewis addressing such Cold War anxieties is a poem titled On the Atomic Bomb, a metrical experiment, which was published in The Spectator at the end of 1945. And I was fortunate enough to examine an early manuscript of this poem at the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College last summer. Lewis writes with characteristic level-headedness about the bomb. He says, This marks no huge advance in the dance of death. His pincers were grim before with chances of cold, fire, suffocation, 
Ogpu, that's the Soviet police force, and cancer. Later in the poem, Lewis writes, As if your puny gadget could dodge the terrible logic of history. No, the tragic road will go on. New generations trudge it. Now, interestingly here, in Lewis's original manuscript, which he sent to his friend Owen Barfield in a letter, there's a variant of the final line of this stanza, where Lewis writes, The long tragic tale ends, not till the master comes to judge it. So in this early variant, Lewis hints at a more apocalyptic view of the nuclear age. I don't know why Lewis chose this variant, uh, instead of why he chose not to use this variant, but instead chose the one that leans more towards Stoic fatalism than a more explicitly Christian explanation. But elsewhere in his corpus, especially in the essay On Living in an Atomic Age, Lewis claims that Christians don't need to be overly worried about, the, about nuclear warfare, since, quote, you and all whom you loved were already sentenced to death before the atomic bomb was invented and quite a high percentage of us were going to die in unpleasant ways. So if death is inevitable, then at least, Lewis writes, let that bomb come find us doing sensible and human things, not huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs. Now Lewis admits that the atomic bomb does bring other threats besides individual death, namely the death of civilization itself. But what was the world like to begin with, he asks. Was it really worth saving? In Willing Slaves of the Welfare State, Lewis writes that the hydrogen bomb was not an inhibitor of progress, but merely a symptom of the deterioration of a world that was fallen to begin with. Quote, As a Christian, I take it for granted that human history will someday end. And then he expresses greater concern for what he calls what the bomb is doing already than what it might do if deployed. Once again, he complains that the bomb is distracting people from the greater business of virtuous living, and that it's poisoning the world with anxiety. As for the ethicality of using the atomic bomb on an enemy, Lewis seems to have mixed feelings. Speaking about Hiroshima in a 1950 letter, he writes that the question is a very difficult one, mixed with feelings of regret and necessity, Britain, he claimed, was rather powerless in the Cold War. He writes in one letter, We couldn't agree with you more about the madness of the atomic bomb. But what can one do? Unilateral disarmament seemed to invite another invasion from the East, and he reported Warney's belief that the best guarantee of peace would be to state that the leaders of losing nations in any war that might be fought should be executed. Lewis, though, follows up with a quip that is more profound than it may seem at first. He writes, apropos, I should like to have heard what the Japanese Warren had to say about that. Now, I assume he's referring to the fact that Hirohito was not prosecuted for war crimes, but I think it demonstrates that Lewis realized a deeper point. When you make threats, when you abide by mutually assured destruction, those threats don't work if one of the men pushing the button wants to die. But what perhaps bothered Lewis most about warfare in the atomic age was the disappearance of even the vestiges of knightly chivalry on the battlefield. The world where Peter, Edmund, and Eustace go to learn and practice comme il faut is not the world they go back to, including the battlefields. Increasingly, he comes to blame the perils of modern warfare, not only on the men using them, but also on their tools. As early as 1942, Lewis was complaining, or contemplating rather, modern warfare in a strange epigram, which has later been titled by Don King, Epitaph. This poem describes a woman who was beautifully, delicately made, till the bomb came, which is the same, beautifully, delicately made. In his inaugural lecture at Cambridge in 1954, this is where Lewis argued that the birth of the machines was an epical moment in human history, altering man's place in nature, is what he writes. Likely there, he was thinking of one such machine, the machine gun. But atomic weapons are exponentially worse than any weapon used even in the First World War, 
From reasons Lewis explains in a remarkable 1956 letter to Edward Allen, he writes, A really modern weapon, a machine which is a skillless which a skillless man can work by pressing a button to the destruction of thousands himself in safety, all of that is disgusting. But a bow, or a pistol, or sword, a thing used face to face, that is a different matter. Tools are the point, he writes. A tool is a thing a man uses with his own skill, and he loves. Machines, which work themselves, are quite different. So here we see Lewis's deep admiration for the individual soldier, but not necessarily for the military at large, nor for the industrial complex, or even for officers, and particularly leaders, the skillless men, he says, who can destroy millions of lives with one button pushed while they themselves are still in safety. Lewis seems to have an even greater fear of the technocratic state that exploits people's fears of atomic warfare. In a letter to an American surgeon in July 1950, the same month, by the way, that MacArthur was asking the Joint Chiefs to use atomic weapons in Korea, and Julius Rosenberg was arrested for Soviet espionage, Lewis writes, well, the sky darkens again. You will perhaps have read already in the papers that our government's only move so far has been a lot of gas about civil defense and a resolution to seize this golden opportunity of stealing a few more of our liberties from us. <laughs> Try not to judge us by our rulers, he laments. Nevertheless, I do think Lewis saw British pride in previous victories over Germany as the real liability, one which might lead the West to either believe they were unconquerable or would lead them to rationalize in a moment of danger the use of any means necessary to protect the state. In On Living on the Atomic Age, Lewis writes, Nothing is more likely to destroy a species or a nation than a determination to survive at all costs. Natural laws, he says, direct us to pursue that goal. But <clears throat> Lewis says the spiritual laws of a Christian must never put mere survival first, not even the survival of our species. He says we must resolutely train ourselves to feel that the survival of man on this earth, much more of our own nation or culture or class, is not worth having unless it can be had by honorable and merciful means. Yet even here, one detects misgivings about Lewis's attempt to put a bright face on the otherwise dismal reality of living in the atomic age. While the bomb has been beneficial in waking us up from a pretty dream to the reality that we all live under, this reminder, he says, is, so far as it goes, a good thing. He's paraphrasing from what he learned from his colleagues in the physical sciences at Oxford, saying that nobody holds out hope that organic life is going to be a permanent possibility in any part of the material universe. So if the naturalists are correct in assuming that there's nothing beyond nature, well then, what's the point about worrying about the atomic bomb? But of course, just because nature is a sinking ship, that doesn't mean we have to blow up the hull. Furthermore, if Christians are to reject survival of the fittest, to follow in private or public life the law of love and temperance, even when they seem to be suicidal of our species, as he puts it, then that begs a question for me. Why is it less honorable and merciful to use atomic weapons than other means of mass destruction which were used and stockpiled in World War II? You think, for instance, of machine guns, firebombing, such as was used in Iwo Jima or in the Battle of Berlin, or even chemical weapons. Either way, we're a long way off from knightly chivalry and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Perhaps that is why, in Lewis's later Narnia books, as the full import and meaning of the Cold War settles in, you see fewer battles. And when there is violence, it's either muffled and non-lethal, or it's darkly portrayed, hardly glorifying battle in the ways the earlier books do. In The Horse and His Boy, for instance, Bree longs to fight in the Narnian Wars, where I shall fight as a free horse among my own people. Yet when the moment of truth comes, Bree isn't the war horse he thinks he is. <laughs>
he ends up watching, along with the reader, from the sidelines as Shasta and Corin defend Arkenland. In the silver chair, the children are, with two exceptions, the recipients of violence rather than the wielders of it. In The Magician's Nephew, the last book Lewis wrote in the series, though it's chronologically the first, this book contains no scenes, from my memory, with children or other Narnians being violent. Though there is, in this book, a stark warning about future battles. When Polly asks whether the world they live in, the magician's nephew, I'll remind you, is set at the turn of the 20th century, she asks, is that world, our world, as bad as Charn, the ancient world destroyed by Queen Jadis? Aslan replies, not yet, but you are growing more like it. It's not certain that some wicked one of your race will not find out a secret as evil as the deplorable word and use it to destroy all living things. And soon, very soon, before you are an old man and you an old woman, great nations in your world will be ruled by tyrants who care no more for joy and justice and mercy than the Empress Jadis. Let your world beware. Surely this prophecy not only refers to Hitler or Mussolini, but also to those who discovered the secret that could be used to destroy all living things. In a book describing the creation of a new world, we also find a warning about the possible destruction of our own. And then there's the last battle, which of course does indeed contain warfare, as the title belies. But while the Narnians' fight against the Calarmines is noble and courageous, it is also fought in the dark. The battle lines are not clearly drawn. Uh, think, for instance, of the dwarfs attacking whichever side had a momentary advantage. And ultimately, the Narnians in this book fail to repel the enemy with violence. When Aslan finally does arrive, he praises Tyrion as the last of the kings of Narnia who stood firm at the darkest hour which for me echoes Churchill's apocalyptic rhetoric from the Battle of Britain. But Narnia itself is not saved by the children's use of violence. It is completely destroyed by Aslan. I suppose every war might feel like the end of the world to those who experience it, but nevertheless, it shows that Lewis had Armageddon on his mind, as most everyone else did in the Cold War era. Now, 1956 brought another threat of war to Britain, or at least to British interests, that seemed to greatly disturb C.S. Lewis. On Oct uh, I'm sorry, August 23rd, he responds to a letter from Stephen Schofield, a Canadian writer who evidently had asked for clarification about Christian service in war. Lewis replies, by the Christian ideal of the Christian at arms and a just cause, I mean the knight as he is pictured in all the romances of the Middle Ages. Surely Lewis realized how out of touch this might sound in the context of modern warfare. I don't think Lewis thought it was impossible to be a knight or a good soldier in modern war, but it was certainly a challenge to be the knight in Korea or in Africa. You see, at the end of that month, Lewis writes this curious letter to J.A. Chapman from County Loth, Ireland, where he was on a month-long vacation with Warney. Evidently, while touring the Carlingford Mountains, he was unable to escape the news that the day before, Egypt had kicked out two British diplomats, accusing them of conspiracy, after Egypt had previously nationalized the Suez Canal a month before. This would lead to what was called the Suez Crisis. That came to a head in October, with skirmishes between Israeli and Egyptian military forces. And in hindsight to us, this sounds like a regional conflict, but it's easy to forget that it involved European powers, the United States, and even the Soviet Union as well. Not only did the crisis shake up Cold War politics, but it also embroiled these ancient nations in a conflict that threatened to open up very old wounds. You know, for some American Christians, uh, it heralded a possible opening act for the apocalypse, as conflicts in the Middle East often threaten to do. Lewis, it seems, was not immune to these concerns about what might result from the Suez Crisis, as well as in Hungary, where he was concerned about a, a revolt that was rising up against a communist dictatorship there, and they were about to be put down violently, so he was concerned about that too. 
So in Lewis's letter to Chapman, he writes, Your letter followed me to this lonely place where I look out across Dundalk Bay at the Carlingford Mountains, and beyond them the morns, and strange nocturnal birds. And here he has a quotation, which translated is, To whom as well activity on the seas was a concern. And they lament under the eye of baleful Mars, very visible these nights. The quotation is in Greek, it is from the Odyssey, which Lewis says he was reading at the time along with, interestingly, the Lord of the Rings. But Lewis's concern about activity on the seas is, I think, a reference to Suez, especially with the added reference to the Eye of Baleful Mars, which you'll recall was the god of war. Indeed, later on in November, he writes in another letter, I have a hope we shall get away without a World War III this time. He fancies that Russia is trying to make a second Spanish Civil War out of Suez rather than striking openly against the West, but he says, who knows? As the 1960s approached, Lewis became even more ambivalent on the possibility of positive good coming from war. <clears throat> In The Four Loves, which is perhaps the greatest of his later devotional works, and by the way, it's one of the, it's the only Lewis book that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. owned, Lewis reminds us that since Christ loved and wept over Jerusalem, patriotism does not always need to be demonic, but he does agree with the maxim that patriotism becomes a demon when it becomes a god. True patriotism has little to do with flags and jingoistic pains and military might, but rather it is about a simple love, a love for the way of life, for beer and tea and open fires, trains with compartments in them, and an unarmed police force and all the rest of it, for the local dialect, and a shade less, for our native language. Interestingly, he intentionally shies away from an essay on international ethics, declining to say what acts between nations are wicked. He says, I'm simply ignorant of that. Well, one cannot imagine Lewis declining to call out a nation's wickedness during the Blitzkrieg two decades earlier. It's just unthinkable. In this book, he lauds war poems and sagas. He says the, the poems that celebrate the deeds of, that won the empire, they should be read but we ought not to mix them up with history lessons, or mistake them for serious analysis, or worse still, a justification of imperial policy. Lewis even embraces a sort of multiculturalism here, while warning against the nationalism, which thinks its own men the bravest and its own women the fairest in the world. He says that will produce a lunatic fringe that may shade off into that popular racialism, which Christianity and science equally forbid. Yet with all of these problems with patriotism, it must remain, Lewis concludes, because if it is destroyed, then citizens will be forced to decide, quote, on every international conflict in a purely ethical light will become like the insufferable man who claimed to defend his house against a burglar purely on moral grounds rather than the obvious reason he's defending it because it is his home. But nevertheless, Lewis ends the section by admitting that the opposite claim of assuming a nation's conflicts are always right or divinely ordained is equally erroneous, adding, quote, if our country's cause is the cause of God, Wars must be wars of annihilation. Lewis likely had in mind American readers in this section of the Four Loves, for no other reason than no one in the Soviet Union, which was the only other nation at the time capable of a war of annihilation, was claiming divine sanction of war. Maybe words for us today as well. Two of Lewis's last books of literary criticism, An Experiment in Criticism and Spencer's Images of Life, which was published posthumously, describe in detail Lewis's favorite painting, which might also shed light on the slight transformation we see in his views on war later in life. Michael Ward notes that a copy of Botticelli's Mars and Venus, 
hung in Lewis's rooms at Magdalen in Oxford. And Fowler reports that Lewis had loved this painting ever since he saw a viewing of the original in the National Gallery in 1922. <clears throat> Here's how Lewis describes the meaning of the painting in Spencer's Images of Life. He writes, It's about the victory of beauty over strength and peace over war, perhaps, or Concord's resolution of discord. Later he adds, the impression imparted is rather of a profoundly felt statement that the spirit of love can and should pacify strife. In 1949, Lewis had published a poem titled Adam at Night. It depicts Adam saluting both the hard virtue of Mars and Venus's liquid glory as he spun between them. But just as he spends so much time early in his life defending the hard virtue of war, Lewis in his later years, I think, desired for the liquid glory of Venus, or perhaps more appropriately put, the child of Mars and Venus, Harmonia, which he hoped would be born from a previous half-century of never-ending global conflict. Towards the end of his life, it seems C.S. Lewis just got tired of war. But perhaps there is one final explanation that might be made to explain his ambivalence while at Cambridge. Lewis met an American woman, Joy Davidman, in 1952. And as you might know, their relationship blossomed into friendship and then marriage in 1956, first in a civil ceremony meant to pre uh, prevent Davidman's uh, deportation back to America, but then later in a bedside religious ceremony as Joy lay dying of cancer. On November 9, 1956, seemingly referring again to the Hungarian uprising, Lewis writes to Chad Walsh. He says, I have bad news about Joy. What had been supposed to be rheumatism became so bad that she had to go into hospital, and it has now been diagnosed as cancer. So, the private world is for me as dark as the public world is at this moment for us all. It's interesting how he identifies the Hungarian and Suez crises that year as a dark moment for us all. The cancer, though, momentarily and miraculously receded the following year in 1957, and Joy and Jack Lewis enjoyed a surprisingly vibrant and happy married life until 1960, when the cancer returned and ended her life. Throughout this turbulent time in C.S. Lewis's personal life, he occasionally used a metaphor in his letters to describe his family's situation. The metaphor arose from a passage in Cicero's Tusculan Disputations, which relates the story of a flatterer of Dionysus II of Syracuse, a tyrannical ruler who uh, was a very powerful ruler and also was rather paranoid about assassins. The flatterer's name was Damocles. Damocles was a flatterer of Dionysus, and he once expressed to his ruler how lucky Dionysus was, possessing such military and economic power as he had. Dionysus responds in the story by asking whether Damocles would like to, quote, taste it yourself. And so he, uh, of course, Damocles accepts, and so he lays him on a bed of gold. He has servants wait on him hand and foot. But as Damocles is enjoying this extravagance, Dionysus simultaneously orders, quote, a glittering sword attached to a single horse hair to be let down from the ceiling so as to hang over the neck of the happy man. Once Damocles sees it, he begs Dionysus to be released, as he realizes that there can be no happiness for him over whom some terror is always impending. The sword of Damocles has come to represent the peril that rulers face when sitting in positions of power, yet Lewis transforms this image in a remarkably personal way in his correspondence in 1957. In January, he writes, I've married a lady suffering from cancer. I think she will weather it this time, but after that, life under the sword of Damocles. Very little chance, not exactly none, of a permanent escape. The following week, he writes, I think, please God, we'll get her on her feet again, but till when? For our highest hope is, after all, but that of living under the sword of Damocles. 
And later that year, as Joy's miraculous recovery uh, was complete, he writes to his friend Sheldon Nanakin, her general health and spirits seem excellent. Of course, the sword of Damocles hangs over us. Or should I say, that circumstances have opened our eyes to see the sword of which really hangs always over everyone. This was a year after the Suez Crisis, nearly two months after the Sputnik launch, and a month after the first U.S. combat fatality in Vietnam. This is at the height of the Cold War, and here at this moment, Lewis reaches back to this metaphor from antiquity to describe not only how a political leader or recovering cancer patient is under the constant threat of death, but how everyone was and everyone is. In a letter to Don Giovanni Calabria in July 1952, he does admit, times are grave, though whether they are graver than all others in history he doesn't claim to know. But in typical Louisian cheerfulness, he says, quote, our only security is that the day, the last day, may find us working each one in his own station, and especially giving up dissensions, fulfilling that supreme command that we love one another. But as members of a constitutional monarchy or republic, this must necessarily involve considerations of how to love enemies in international conflicts, or at the very least, whom we elect and represent us in these conflicts. Exhibiting Christian charity on a battlefield is hard enough, but how are Christian soldiers and their fellow citizens at home to do that on a nuclear battlefield? Moreover, how are Christians supposed to cope with Cold War apocalyptic anxieties? Surely it's impossible to fulfill the Great Commission and the Great Commandments from a bunker. Thus we see how Cambridge, the Cold War, and cancer complicated Lewis's previous conceptions of death and violence in the final years of his life. Now that's not to say that Lewis was befuddled by it all, nor do I think his struggles in indicate a general weakness in the just war doctrine. After all, other conflict resolution theories, such as pacifism, deterrence, and total war, are also fraught with peril. However, this presentation has argued that Lewis's views on war are, on closer inspection, not as simplistic and unified as some scholars have previously portrayed. In discussions with my fellow Lewis scholars at Oxbridge, I realized something. You know, we often assume a writer's initial promulgation of a position is the one that they stick to for the rest of their lives. But people do change their minds. And while I do not think Lewis completely reverses his earlier positions on war, I think he does realize towards the end of his life the extraordinary challenges involved in solving international conflicts in a nuclear age. In Narnia, Peter is instructed by Aslan to wipe the blood off his sword after battle. But in our world, it is more difficult to remove the stains from our weapons. Today, the swords aren't only sheathed at our side, but they are also hung perilously above our heads by an ever-increasingly thin strand. Yet, in such times, Lewis advises readers not to respond with anxiety or reactionary violence, nor even resignation at our powerlessness, but rather to engage with a renewed commitment to faith, hope, and charity, even at great personal risk. You know, Lewis thought that ethics was two-edged, meaning that natural values could be a schoolmaster to spiritual values. Or as the old saying goes, any road out of Jerusalem is a road into Jerusalem. When honorable service in war is denied to us, there is a possible higher duty to which we may aspire. Martyrdom. Galahad is the son of Lancelot, Lewis says. And while courage may be discovered on Armageddon's battlefield, it can also be learned in places like Gethsemane or Birmingham. Gethsemane, that's the place where a man once told a friend to sheathe his sword rather than wield it, and chose to let the sword of Damocles fall on his head instead. <laughs>
Thanks for watching, and I hope you've enjoyed it.